Welcome everyone to the uh, third UCIPM Urban and Community Webinar Series. I'm Carrie Winville Rojas. I'm the Associate Director for the Urban and Community Program. So today we have with us um, our guest speaker, Dr. Andrew Sutherland. Uh, Dr. Sutherland is the Urban IPM Advisor for um, the University of California Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources and UCIPM. With, uh, he is housed in the San Francisco Bay Area and serves, uh, I think it's five counties there. Very busy person. Uh, Dr. Sutherland is a board certified entomologist and he focuses his applied research education and outreach programs on developing and evaluating management strategies for key urban insect pests that threaten home and health, um, such as bed bugs, cockroaches, and termites. He works closely with the pest control industry, uh, schools, housing providers, and government agencies to improve pest management programs, keeping our communities safe and protecting the environment. So Andrew, why don't you go ahead and share your screen? And when you are ready, you can begin. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Can you guys hear me? Thumbs up. Yep. Awesome. All right. Um, so as Carrie mentioned, we're going to talk today about household pests you may encounter in the springtime. And in truth, there are lots of pests um, all the time, if you look closely enough, but I'm going to focus on just a few that I personally find in my house every spring. Um, and probably some of you will share these experiences. So uh, thanks for the introduction. A little bit more, uh, I am the urban IPM advisor in the San Francisco Bay Area. I maintain a robust research and extension program here. And I hope you uh, would like to learn more about my program. I do have a website that I invite you to visit. It's uh, basically, you can, you can Google Urban IPM and my website will be the top return. So please check it out. There's been a recent redesign, including a mission statement here. We work with professionals to improve pest control through research and education in order to protect our communities and the environment. So take a look. Uh, also, if you're interested in supporting my program, we are selling a beautiful poster. And this is a full size, uh, I believe it's 24 by 36 inch poster that uh, shows all of the common cockroach species you can find in California. This was designed and produced by my staff researcher, Casey Hubble. She's an excellent entomologist as well as a graphic artist. So check this out. Uh, we're selling these for $15 a piece uh, plus shipping, um, or you can buy three of them and the shipping is free. So it does uh, support my uh, research and education program throughout the Bay Area. So what are we gonna cover today? I'll talk a little bit about urban IPM. I think um, a lot of the speakers in this seminar series will touch on this, but I'll tell you what it means to me, why it's important to me, and then we'll dive right into three common springtime pests I have identified in my home pretty much every year uh, in the springtime, carpet beetles, fleas, and fungus gnats. My wife has a huge houseplant collection. It's growing every year, and uh, we do get fungus gnats on those houseplants. There are, of course, lots of other pests you may encounter in the spring, and we'll talk uh, briefly about some of those. And then finally, I will showcase, with uh, time permitting, some UC IPM resources. My hope is that this kind of seasonal smorgasbord presentation can be repeated in other seasons. Um, and I'll have to talk to Carrie and uh, Elaine and Belinda about that. Um, but I'd love to talk to you guys about autumn pests and summertime pests and winter pests, because you do tend to see certain, uh, at least insect pests at certain times of the year. So what's IPM? Um, 
The acronym stands for Integrated Pest Management. And simply, IPM is a way that we manage pests while minimizing negative impacts associated with pest management. And it's important that we look at this first bullet. You must manage the pest. If you are uh, you know, releasing natural enemies and you know, using reduced risk pesticides and doing all these things that are consistent with IPM, but you haven't managed the pest, then your IPM program was not successful. So above all, you must manage the pest and that means keep it below an unacceptable level. But then of course, we want to minimize all of the negative impacts that may be associated, especially with pesticides on the environment, on our communities, um, and, and make it a sustainable program. So that's what IPM means to me. Um, I teach it in a different way to my professional clients as a step-by-step -step process. And I'm not gonna go into that IPM soapbox here, but suffice to say, it begins with education and prevention. You really have to know what pests you're likely to encounter and uh, which tactics you may use to prevent those pests. Because if we can prevent pests from becoming a problem, we never have to worry about choosing uh, uh, the least toxic pesticide or something like that. So um, stay tuned. We're going to talk a lot about IPM uh, with all of these pests, focusing on education and prevention. What's the scope of this presentation? Um, as I mentioned, there are lots of pests out there. We are going to concentrate on California pests. And that is uh, important to mention because we have a very specific uh, weather pattern um, here. It's Mediterranean climate. So in the spring, you have a unique situation in California where you have moisture in the soil. You know, it's not always present in the soil, especially if there's no irrigation present um, and temperatures warming. So um, we're drying out very fast this year. It almost looks like summer already. But when I think of spring in California, I'm thinking of soil that is moist and beginning to dry out and temperatures that are mild and beginning to warm. And so these conditions are very important for especially insect pests and uh, certain parts of their life cycle may be triggered by uh, these conditions. When we talk about household, I'm talking about inside and immediately around your home. So I'm not talking about garden pests today. I'm talking about pests you may find inside, living in your house with you. <clears throat> and I mentioned that uh, there are lots of pests out there. If you do a uh, Google search, springtime pests, you're gonna get a bunch of different lists and they usually are gonna be tied to regions. So again, I'm focusing on California. Uh, my experience is specifically with uh, the Bay Area and um, Davis Sacramento area. But if you wanna learn about other pests, we have uh, information on hundreds of them. So part of your uh, homework here is to check out our UC IPM web pages and navigate towards the pest of your particular interest. Okay. So let's jump right in. Uh, pest number one, carpet beetles. Lovely small beetle, uh, kind of superficially resembling a ladybird beetle or ladybug. Um, and uh, you may look at this and say, oh yeah, I saw those on my windowsill last week um, or in Southern California, maybe it was last month. But you know, what are these guys doing? What are they all about? The adults are uh, small beetles. And again, they do resemble ladybird beetles, but one way I can tell them apart, um, some people may say, oh, well, ladybird beetles are large, but ladybird beetles come in, in all sizes. Uh, one way that I tell um, carpet beetles, which are actually dermested uh, beetles apart from ladybird beetles, is their ventral side, so their belly is rounded rather than flat. Um, a coccinellid or ladybird beetle has a very flat uh, ventral side. And you can kind of see that in this image here where you do have uh, kind of a, a round cross section 
um, in, in addition to a round outline. And there's a number of uh, important species, but in California, it's really just three. And I would say 90% of the time, we're talking about this species here, Anthrenus verbaski, uh, known as the varied or variegated carpet beetle. Uh, we also have uh, what's called the uh, furniture beetle, furniture carpet beetle, and the black carpet beetle, which is kind of a glossy, uh, unicolored species here. And all of these are going to be, you know, three, maybe four millimeters long, so quite small. What are they doing? Um, you're going to see them in the spring. It's because they feed on pollen and nectar. And they're um, either native or ubiquitous insects all over the place. So you can go outside and you're going to find them on flowering plants as adults right now. Uh, if you go to iNaturalist, which is kind of a collection of, um, uh, you know, citizen science or resident science observations, you see this peak here. Uh, you know, these are all reported observations. These are backed by some kind of verification here in the green curve. But there's a peak in uh, April and May. So we're in that peak now. Outdoors, um, carpet beetles may only have one generation per year, especially in northern climates. And so this is the time right now when the adults are emerging, they're flying around, they're looking for love, they're looking to uh, lay eggs and start the next generation. It's the larvae of these guys that cause damage indoors and are considered pests. They feed on natural fibers, especially animal fibers like wool and pet hair, you know, dog and cat hair. And, um, but they, they can eat all kinds of stuff, you know. Um, my wife had a feather collection one year that uh, was just in a vase, lots of all these beautiful feathers. And um, carpet beetles, you know, really hammered it. Um, so anything with keratin, including horns, you know, animal horns that are starting to degrade, or even certain low density bones can be consumed. Um, so they'll eat all kinds of things. Dead insects. So uh, the photo on the lower right is um, a pinned uh, insect specimen, a wasp, which is being attacked by two of these carpet beetle larvae. Um, but because they like dead insects, they often, the adults are attracted to uh, spider webs, birds nests, areas where you do have dead and decomposing uh, insect remains, um, and the larvae will eat that stuff. Uh, they call them carpet beetles because if you do have a natural fiber carpet, or perhaps the backing is made of some kind of natural fiber, you will uh, have problems with these guys. They will eat wool, but they'll attack all kinds of things. This is a, an image from our pest note of a child's art project that had some food items, including pasta and beans, uh, but also some yarn, perhaps wool yarn. And so they get into uh, this um, beautiful creation and um, they eat it. So, um, you know, commonly wool clothing, um, and you can usually separate damage from carpet beetles from clothes moths because the carpet beetles will eat a pretty large area uh, in one, you know, one, one go, or at least they'll concentrate their feeding in one area. Clothes moths, you often see scattered damage, you know, little pinholes all over a garment. Um, but yeah, you look online, you find all kinds of sad stories about, you know, this is a wool puppet that was attacked by carpet beetles and now he lives in the freezer. So I found a blog article about this particular puppet suffering from uh, carpet beetle larvae. <clears throat> so, you know, how do we prevent this problem in our homes? Uh, we know the adults are flying around in the spring. So we really should try to prevent the adult beetles from entering the home in the first place. If they can't get into the home, they can't lay eggs, the eggs don't hatch, the larvae don't cause the damage. And so this means proper sealing of windows and doors. Spring cleaning, it's a great time of the year to make sure your screens fit well, they don't have holes in them, and you don't have gaps around your window frames and especially around your exterior doors. Um, if you're bringing plants inside, 
uh, or flowers, perhaps an arrangement. Just take a look and make sure they're not dripping with carpet beetle adults because those adults uh, may find something that they can lay eggs on and support their larvae in your home. If you do find adults indoors and they're attracted to sunlight, so they often will fly to a windowsill, uh, you can remove them, put them back outside if you like. You can vacuum them up. Um, most of the time they get stuck in the windowsill area. It's hot, it's dry, so you'll find dead adults uh, indoors. Doesn't necessarily mean you have a pest problem indoors. You can remove those adults and um, just know what you're dealing with. Oh, that's a carpet beetle. The more you vacuum, uh, the harder it is for carpet beetles to get started in your home, especially pet hair. Um, I have cats. I used to have a dog. He was an older dog that shed a lot. And so even if you have a nice, uh, you know, clean, uncluttered home, you can have hair that collects in drifts, you know, back in the corners, back behind the furniture, in spider webs and um, dead insects in the spider webs as well. And that's an excellent food source for carpet beetle larvae. Uh, if you have a lot of woolen items, make sure you're storing them properly. Uh, that includes, you know, insect proof containers, which are high density plastic, glass, metal, some kind of a tight fitting uh, wood. And um, that way you, you can't have beetles get in there and lay eggs. Wandering larvae will have a hard time getting in there. Uh, the same goes for dry pet foods. Um, which will become infested by carpet beetles as well as a lot of other stored product pests. And then if you do have a large collection of wool clothing, uh, inspect it regularly, maybe air it out. Um, you know, don't squirrel it away and forget about it because uh, the insects will find it. If you do have a carpet beetle problem, uh, first off, how do you know you have a problem? Again, if you're just finding a few beetles, that may not mean there are developing insects in your home. It could just be beetles that wandered in uh, and they got trapped in the windowsill. Um, but if you do find developing larvae, and you would know that because you would see their shed skins, you would see damage to something, um, one of these foodstuffs, you would see little pellets, little frass um, from their feeding you probably wanna do something because they're going to develop into adults. The adults can lay eggs uh, once they mate and um, the infestation can grow. So find the infested items or locations where breeding is occurring. Discard items if possible. Launder items, uh, vacuum, vacuum is your best friend. Um, certain items will need to be dry cleaned. Um, I will say that there are some furniture items like uh, large upholstered furniture that may be stuffed with natural fibers like feathers or hair. That's a very special circumstance. You're gonna have a hard time disinfesting something like that and you may need professional fumigation. But other than a special circumstance like that, you can usually disinfest your uh, carpet beetle infested items yourself. There are even techniques uh, using household freezers, household ovens, although you should be very careful because uh, some things can be damaged and of course there's risk of fire um, if you're using the oven. So uh, look online, you can find uh, how-tos on these processes. Carpet beetles, uh, you don't need insecticides to kill carpet beetles. Insecticides are not usually warranted unless you are a museum or a taxidermy specialist or something and you have lots of uh, foodstuffs for these guys, um, you're not going to need insecticides. Next on the menu, fleas. Um, we're all familiar with fleas, they're no fun, um, but did you know, according to some re research that came out last year, Fleas are parasitic scorpion flies. There's your entomological uh, trivia tidbit for the day. Uh, basically, um, based on molecular data in 2020, just published, um, a phylogeny shows that fleas are nested within another insect order, Macoptera. 
uh, also known as the scorpion flies. So there you go. Uh, very specialized insects, but they look nothing like their closest relatives or very little like their closest relatives. Uh, so fleas, were, most of us are familiar with these guys. The adults are the pest life stage. Now this is in contrast to the carpet beetles where the larvae were the ones doing damage. Adult fleas are wingless, but they can jump around and crawl quite readily. And they feed obligately on blood, especially of vertebrate animals. Most common in California and perhaps the world is the cat flea. Now cat fleas feed on all kinds of vertebrates, not just cats. They are the most common species on dogs, as well as one of the most common on urban wildlife. And they certainly will bite humans. Um, they are unique among fleas, or relatively unique, in that they stay on the host. So the adult fleas ride around on the dog or cat um, rather than spend most of their time in the environment. Some other fleas will do that. And of course, they bite us, they drink our blood, that's no good, but they also can transmit pathogens and tapeworms, uh, not only to your pets, but sometimes you know children will eat fleas incidentally, and now they've got a tapeworm. So um, major public health problem, um, not to be taken lightly. The threshold for flea management is one animal. That means you find one flea, you really should do something about it. Um, I showed here the uh, iNaturalist seasonal occurrence or seasonal observation, and it's not as clear cut as what we saw with the carpet beetles. But remember, this is a national database of observations. In California, flea incidence is uh, punctuated uh, in the springtime. And the reason is because the soil is moist outside and the temperatures are starting to warm. These are conditions that are required by the larvae for development. So what about the larvae? Uh, some of you may have never seen flea larvae or even you know, knew that flea have the, fleas have these uh, legless worm-like larvae. Um, they uh, are down in some kind of a substrate. Outside, it may be sandy soil or mulch. Uh, indoors, it could be carpet or pet bedding. It's usually an area where the adults are uh, present, usually on the host animal. So indoors, it may be the, the dog's bed, for instance. Outdoors, it may be um, a bedding area or a nest area of a raccoon or an opossum. And the adult fleas, uh, they poop um, of you know, digested or partially digested blood, and that's what the larvae eat among other bits of organic detritus. And so they're wriggling around and they're eating this uh, stuff that's falling off of the host animal or being excreted by uh, the adult fleas. And then um, the life cycle, uh, I'll show you a diagram here in a second, but you got your eggs, um, they're quite small. You're talking about a millimeter, maybe a little more. You can see them with your naked eye, but they're very small. Then this uh, wriggling larva that gets up to about four or five millimeters, and they actually will form a uh, cocoon uh, of sorts where they pupate within this protected enclosure that they've constructed out of detritus in the environment. So again, here's the life cycle. The adult flea is depositing eggs, usually on the host animal, but they're not sticky. They fall off and then they hatch in the environment. You've got a few stages of the larvae. The larvae will form this uh, 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 pupil uh, case or pupil cell. And that uh, pupa can actually um, withstand very extreme environmental conditions, and it can delay emergence of the adult for months. Uh, some literature suggests six months or more. And so in California, outdoors, uh, this is how they sometimes will survive very hot, very dry conditions. And then when hosts are present or when uh, larval development conditions are right, the adults uh, emerge. So how do we prevent fleas in the first place? 
Um, I treat my pets proactively with insecticides and I suggest you look into this practice. If you are in an area where you know you have flea pressure. So I know I have fleas, I live in the Bay Area. Uh, there's wildlife everywhere, there's high pressure. I treat my animals uh, ahead of time. I know that in March or April, I'm gonna start seeing adult fleas. And so I use an on pet product. Uh, there are a number of different systemic, um, some repellent insecticides. Um, some of them are, you know, systemic in that you apply to the dermis of the animal and it spreads through the hair or through the, uh, the blood of the animal. Uh, others are actually uh, uh, oral uh, medicines that you feed as a pill. And some of these um, you will need to consult with your veterinarian or get a prescription but this is the number one um, uh, best proactive tactic in my opinion. And, and that's because this is a pest that we cannot tolerate at any level because it does make us sick. We can also prevent fleas by vacuuming regularly. So here we are with vacuuming again, especially uh, areas where um, pets or other animals are spending a lot of time uh, indoors. <clears throat> groom and bathe your pets. When it comes to outside uh, flea populations, um, the one thing you can do is try to exclude wildlife. And you may have wildlife that visit your yard. That's great. I love animals coming and, you know, eating fruit and drinking water uh, on my property, but I don't want them nesting there. I don't want them spending a lot of time there, especially let's say in the sub area under the house um, and raising their young, um, that's a recipe for, for uh, fleas. So if possible, really look at the, um, access, the access to your crawl space, um, access to the attic, um, other places where wildlife may enter and try to exclude wildlife. It's great uh, flea prevention. You can also try to increase ventilation of that crawl space and you know maybe other areas near the home. Uh, decrease moisture, and this is a good practice for other pests like termites uh, immediately around the home. What about management? Um, here we are again with treating our pets. Uh, it's a great practice if you have pets. Um, with fleas, management requires locating the breeding location and eliminating that breeding location. Now that's especially true if you don't have pets. So you, let's say you have a flea problem and you don't have any pets. You can't treat your pets. You have to figure out where the fleas are breeding. And it's going to be some sheltered, moist location. And uh, if you can find that location um, and uh, it's indoors, uh, you can vacuum that up. Um, you, can, you can launder things like uh, bedding that may be infested. Uh, indoors, uh, there are some insecticides that can be considered. Uh, the best are the insect growth regulators. There's two active ingredients here, and these should be used as directed sprays. That means you only apply them to areas where you know or suspect uh, larvae are developing. Um, you can buy products that are called bug bombs, but they may be hazardous. You know, they contain flammable propellants sometimes, and so they can explode, uh, but they're also ineffective. They can be ineffective. Um, the active ingredients are sometimes uh, pyrethroid insecticides, and many populations of fleas are actually resistant. The adult fleas are resistant to these insecticides. So even though uh, bug bombs are clearly labeled for fleas, they're not always gonna be effective and they may be hazardous. For outdoor populations, there are really no viable insecticide applications that will help out, um, at least not available to consumers. Um, professionals may have products that can help uh, provide some relief. Okay, the final uh, insect to cover here, fungus gnats. And again, um, these are pests of houseplants. So if you have a large houseplant collection, and I know it's becoming very popular with the Instagram set 
um, to show off your house plants and to have hundreds, sometimes thousands of house plants in the house, uh, you will sometimes have pest problems associated with those. So fungus gnats, um, the adults are going to be most readily visible. They're small black flies. Um, you may first notice them at night when you're on your cell phone in bed. We all do that, right? We're falling asleep and we're on our smartphone and the adult flies are attracted to uh, the screen, you know, the, the lighting of the screen. So you may see them, they may buzz in your ear, they're quite annoying, um, but you also may see the adults running along the soil surface of your house plants or hanging out on the leaves or the container. The adults are not causing damage to the plants. Some species the adults don't even eat, other species the adults eat uh, leaf exudates or, you know, nectar. The larvae are the ones that can actually damage house plants. Um, although you could argue that the adults are the nuisance for us, right? When we're on our smartphones at night. But the larvae are, uh, they're maggots. Remember, these are fly larvae, uh, quite small, um, less than four millimeters, kind of translucent. And they are feeding on fine roots as well as uh, shoots and leaves that are in contact with the soil. And so they can actually cause quite a bit of damage, um, especially if the populations are high. You can start to see plants declining when you have a high population of these guys. Uh, so here we are with our iNaturalist curves. On top is um, the family of fungus gnats, Ciaridae, which is very common outdoors. Uh, and um, you see a strong association with springtime. And remember, this is a national curve. So uh, the family of flies called fungus gnats, there's a spike in the spring where you're gonna have adults. Most people are not observing the larvae. So these observations are almost all adults. And so there's a wide variety of different fungus gnats that uh, kind of spike in April and May. And um, indoors, our most common species is uh, of the genus Bradicia. And so there's also a curve of observations on iNaturalist associated with Bradicia species. And you also see this uh, um, kind of spike in March and April, but then uh, other observations throughout the year. And the reason is because once you have a population of fungus gnats indoors, uh, they're protected in that environment and they will have successive generations in your home. So you may have uh, other population spikes throughout the year, but this is the time of year that they may initially colonize or that you may see a lot of adults emerging from an existing infestation. So how do we prevent and manage fungus gnats? Uh, we can try to exclude the adults and they're quite small, but again, we can try to seal our windows and doors so that they can't fly right in. Um, you can avoid moving plants in and out. And I know that a lot of houseplant enthusiasts will do that and they say, you know, this plant's not that happy. I'm gonna bring it out for a week or I'm gonna let it get some rain. Um, that's great, but you do run the risk of bringing pests back in when you bring that plant back in. So just be cognizant of that. If your plant species will allow for it, I like to dry the soil out between watering. Um, this is easier said than done. It's kind of tricky. Plants can get water stressed, but if you're able to do this, the fungus gnat larvae are much less likely to survive. They really need a lot of uh, constant moisture to avoid drying out themselves. You can also use uh, yellow sticky cards. Uh, these are commonly used in agriculture and production horticulture um, for monitoring. Um, the adult fungus gnats get stuck on these cards quite readily. So you can use them for monitoring to find out if you have a problem which part of the house, maybe it's the worst, uh, but you can also remove adults from the population. And so if you have a raging fungus gnat problem, putting a bunch of sticky cards up can actually help you to remove 
uh, adults before um, they have a chance to breed and lay eggs. So you won't control the whole population that way, but you can reduce the population. And there are some uh, products that are bioinsecticides uh, that are on the market, um, primarily Bacillus thuringiensis products, BT. Make sure it's the subspecies Israeliensis. That's the subspecies that is effective against fly larvae. Most BT products are only effective against uh, caterpillars. So if you buy one of those, it's not going to do anything against um, these uh, fungus gnat larvae. And then there are some uh, nematode products uh, that are out there. Make sure you buy the ones that have uh, the genus Steiner Nema, especially Steiner Nema feltii is um, a nematode species proven by research to attack fungus gnat larvae. So what does that look like? Um, again, these uh, yellow sticky cards are often used in production horticulture, uh, but in a houseplant situation, and considering that fungus gnats run along the soil media, like to stay close to the soil media during the day, you can actually just lay these cards uh, either horizontally or position them vertically right near the soil surface, <clears throat> excuse me, and you will catch a lot of flies. And, and um, so these guys are getting removed from the population. Uh, the BT products, uh, there's a number of them. There's one called natural, natural, which can be uh, mixed as a slurry and applied. Uh, but some people actually use the uh, mosquito bits. Mosquito bits are uh, designed to be used in ponds or water features against mosquito larvae but there's actually uh, information on the new product label that tells you how to use them as fungus gnat control in houseplants. And so what happens is the larvae eat uh, a uh, bacterial bioproduct, which destroys their gut. And so they have eventually starve and will not reach adulthood. So it's considered a bioinsecticide and it only has uh, uh, impacts on fly larvae in this particular case. And then there is a, a number, are a number of nematode products that you can use. Nematodes are tricky to use. It's a live product. It's a live little microscopic worms that you're applying. And so you have to make sure that uh, product is viable and it's applied in the right way to ensure survival and efficacy of these little worms. Okay, um, I mentioned there are lots of other pests that you may see in the spring. Um, if you're out in the garden, you may notice this is the prime time for earwigs. Uh, they are also dependent on soil moisture. Uh, they have their young at this time of the year, um, primarily. And so you will see a lot of earwig pressure in your vegetable garden. Uh, what about honeybees? We don't consider honeybees as pests usually, but in the spring, you can have a behavior called swarming occur. And that's when a colony is large enough that it actually splits. And uh, some of the bees will go with one queen and another uh, group will go with another queen. And um, so that's happening in the spring. Um, you may be seeing that activity. And the problem is sometimes these swarming bees leave a hive situation and end up in somebody's home or in a hollow tree uh, causing a pest problem or a structural uh, pest problem. So we do have a pest note about that. Ants, especially uh, Argentine ants, carpenter ants, velvety tree ants, they may be expanding their foraging ranges. They may be uh, uh, reproducing quickly right now. And so you may be likely to see some ant problems right now. Not the same ant invasion problems you might see in the fall in California, but uh, you can certainly see ants get into homes right now. And then uh, some of our termite populations, uh, subterranean termites uh, actually swarm in the spring as well, tipping you off that they are underground, potentially uh, threatening your home or other wooden structures. Now, I don't know if my friend and colleague, Dr. Neve Quinn is listening, but I thought I should include at least one vertebrate pest uh, because she's a, a vertebrate biologist and um, I put gophers here, but really there are lots of vertebrate pests that may rear their heads this time of year. 
Um, they are often reproducing this time of year. They may be expanding their own territories or foraging ranges. Uh, males may be competing with one another and moving each other into new territories. So uh, there's really no shortage of pests in the springtime. Um, remember to check out the UCIPM website. We have a number of great resources there, including the pest notes uh, that I uh, took a lot of information from for today's presentation. These are available as web pages as well as PDFs that can be downloaded and printed out to share with people. This is uh, one of our most popular pest notes, the carpet beetles pest note. A lot of great information there. Um, here's a new one that I wanted to highlight. Uh, this one is called houseplant problems. And again, I know houseplants are becoming very popular and they do have pest issues. So check it out. It's available as a PDF or as a web page. Um, and then um, some of you may be master gardeners, but for those of you who are California residents, please know that every county in the state has a UC master gardener program that has trained uh, experts to help diagnose pest problems and help you with pest management issues. So find your local program and get to know them. So thank you all very, very much for um, participating today. Thank you so much, Andrew, for this great presentation.